privileged demographics like me have access to the media, especially thinking when I was an environmentalist, you have access to the media, your voice is heard, and there's a kind of type two error. Of course you're going to hear the voice of these privileged elites. doesn't mean other people aren't saying it. So I'm not, I'm not saying that proves the point, I'm just saying let's be very careful. And then the point about what to do about these challenges, I mean, again, I don't know, we're all... The idea that knowledge comes before action is a problem, and the academics, of course, love that. We have to work it out first, then we'll tell you what to do, then you do it. You know, like action precedes knowledge just as often. You don't know unless you act. So let's suck it and see, try things, rather than leave it to academics like me and the Step Centre to pontificate about what you should do. Um, but within that, I think there is. For me, I learned a lesson from looking at past progressive struggles. I mean, transformations are often of a pretty ugly kind in the world, but. Everyone has different ones depending on the politics, but let's just look at those. You know, emancipation from slavery, from coloniality, from colonialism, such as these have occurred, which is far from complete. Women, oppression of women, oppression of workers, oppression of serfs, marginal sexualities, etc. Wherever one looks, how were the victories that have been won in various places around the world, not comprehensively, how were they won? Do that. Were they won by modelling? Were they won by experts giving evidence-based policy? I mean, I don't want to denigrate, there is crucial roles for those kinds of things, a place like Sprue, the bread and butter of Sprue, and, and it's, at crucial moments things happen. But that is not how progressive political change occurs. It's through mobilisation, through flocking behaviour, through a thousand different kinds of actions that, get, that don't scale up, they thrive out. <laughs> and that's, that's, I think, how, how, it, how it works. And no one knows that better than the social movements themselves. And sometimes I think those voices are being suppressed too much by this sort of discourse that we have, me as well, about you know dynamics of policy making. Thanks a lot. I think we have time for another, at least another round of question. Maybe let's see if there's someone who hasn't asked anything. Yes, one question here. Someone else? So Mike, another question? And Finn, please. There's actually so many things I'd like to ask, especially about colonialism, but I don't think we should go there yet. The simple question is, I'd like an answer to it. How do you define clean energy when you consider that every form of energy has some kind of dirt, whether it's now when it's being produced or later in the future? <coughs> and is there something such as clean energy? Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up a bit on the point about who cares most about climate change or other environmental issues. And uh, I mean, I understand the point that once you have your basic needs met, you have your basic economic needs met, um, um, you're more free to care about other things. But I think we're here ignoring a bit the fact that not everyone will be equally um, will equally suffer from climate change or certain types of environmental pollution. So I think a lot of times. Um, the most marginalized and the poorest people are actually the ones who will suffer most from climate change if they're living on a small island or close to the edge of the desert or uh, from environmental pollution if they're living in places where these environmental protections won't be enforced. So do you think that there is uh, sort of a poverty angle to this very, very broadly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd just be interested to hear your opinions on the Green New Deal idea that's been floating around. There's our fourth question, if you don't mind. Yeah. It's just, I mean, is that related to the debate? Sorry, can I do this? Yeah, of course. As a footnote, <laughs> uh, mainly to Andy. I mean, this idea of action before knowledge, and it's, it's quite seductive. Um, in Italy, there's a whole government that has action before <laughs> even knowing what to do, and they keep doing it. So I think I would be a bit cautious about this, especially because people here coming to get knowledge before acting. So <laughs> <laughs> the other issue is the issue that economists haven't got any idea about the political aspect of that, and I think this is a dangerous narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marx would be <laughs> turning in his grave <laughs> for this. And also, many of us have some idea of the political economy aspects on that, and we spend decades in doing this. So I think this narrative is a bit too dichotomic to be um, credible. 
and I think is undermining what many other economic scholarship do. Um, we might contribute to some extent, yeah. even though we like numbers. <laughs> um, and that, that's it. So it's not really related to this, but it's, it's just a footnote on the narrative that you construct. <laughs> Okay, maybe this time. Yeah, start. pretty. I think it's pretty directly related, actually. Right. So, uh, so on, on that point, I mean, it's kind of interesting, though. I, I didn't. I didn't put a dichotomy. I said action shapes knowledge at least as much as the other way around. I'm just. It's a dialectic. You mentioned Marx. It's a, I don't mind Marx being in his grave, by the way. But, uh, but you know, and and actually, your own argument there, saying that because what's happening in Italy is so. Uh, well, it's just problematic. Yeah. Mean, yeah, or, yeah, or also that. because it's undermining the economics, therefore it can't be true. So our actions must self-evidently be against the authoritarian populism, which I agree with. Therefore, somebody arguing how things are should take a different form. It's like going from going from the how thing uh, the Richard was tilting at rightly, I think, arguing from an is to an ought. So I'm just saying it's not. I'm not. It's not a dichotomy. I'm just saying both matter, and actually. It, it is the attitude, as I tried to say earlier, I, th I think, and I, it, I can't claim single causality here, but I think at least as much as me saying that kind of postmodern thing, that, I know it sounds postmodern to you, that's why, you know, that, oh, well, let's be more humble about what expertise can do, that is the way to resist authoritarian <coughs> populism. It is by generations of experts overbearingly claiming more than can be claimed for economics, for social science generally, for natural science, that we have provoked this reaction. So I'm not saying that's definitely true. I'm just saying as a hypothesis, in, in the terms, positive terms you're, you're arguing for, let's give that a, enough attention. And, and then you end up with the opposite conclusion than you drew. And it is, a, you, it, right, it is dangerous to provoke that stuff, so let's not do it. On the um, Green New Deal point... Um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think it's not perfect, uh, whether it be the UK or the US varieties of this, but it's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Thinking positively about innovation as something we make, institutions as things we make, let's be driven by hope, let's be driven by the kind of society we want, rather than these fear-based, control-based, expert-based discourses. And of course, expertise has crucial roles, it's just servant, not master. So I, I'm really excited by Green New Deals, basically, and, and I think they're a great way of, much better way than extinction or, or planetary boundaries or Anthropocene. They are, they are overtly political and exciting for that reason, I think. Um, clean tech, clean energy, nothing's clean, that's true. I mean, clean, I mean we, that, that, it was in the 80s, I think, when clean got replaced in, in reflective areas with cleaner for that very reason. But the point is, what constitutes clean or not clean, if we're using that language, is multidimensional. It's not self-evident how you reduce it down. Some things are sure as hell cleaner than others. So just to say, well, everything's dirty in some way, so let's just build coal or nuclear or plants. It, it, yeah, that sort of argument's invoked all the time. The crucial thing is, though, what counts as cleaner than others is a political matter. We should argue about it. Technology choice is political, I think. Okay, and so that's, that's a value judgment rather than a scientific judgment. It's not rather than. If there are no scientific judgments. Again, uh, uh, Richard, there are no scientific judgments that when uh, engaged prescriptively, don't involve value judgments. That scares me. Well, it may do, but I'm sorry to say <laughs> that's how things are. And, and, and let's be scared about that rather than extinction in five years. That's the scaremongering. I'm scaremongering. <laughs> Let, let's just pick, pick up on this point. Uh, if we compare gas-fired power plants to solar panels, photovoltaics, then what you could say is that the photovoltaics have less CO2 coming out, and that's a scientific fact. But they have more cadmium coming out. And that's also a scientific fact. And then if you want to call that cleaner, that's a value judgment. Yeah, that's a scientific policy. This is the kind of thing we have to know. So there's no such thing as objectively clean, right? You're just okay. shift, shifting problems around. Um, the Green New Deal, I completely disagree with Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are very serious issues here. And if we take the Green New Deal in Alexandria ocasio Cortez's uh, incarnation, right? And there's many different interpretations here. Uh, but essentially what she tries to do is solve everything through environmental policy, but more narrowly solve all the problems in the world through climate policy. I think that is hopelessly naive to think that this is possible. Uh, I am immediately reminded of Tim Bergen that if you have N problems, then you need N instruments. So trying to solve 
more than one problem through one instrument, you're bound to fail. Um, and I also think there is a whole lot of naive and misguided thinking in this. And uh, in Europe, uh, the Green New Deal is more framed as creating employment and industrial transformation and those sort of things. The idea that you can create large employment through energy policy is, I think, hogwash, is, I think, a polite way of saying this. Uh, the energy uh, sector is very labor extensive. Very few people on a national scale compared to the total workforce work in energy. And the idea that you can create lots and lots of jobs there through energy, that just doesn't add up. The numbers simply do not add up. Uh, but then if you start thinking, even if you were to do that, what would these people do? And how would you pay them? Uh, and of course, what we know is that your wage is roughly proportional to your labor productivity. So you can sort of make the argument uh, <coughs> that we're going to create jobs in people who repair photovoltaics on roofs. And yes, you can create lots of jobs there, but how many photovoltaic panels can you really repair in a day, right? Because they won't break uh, neatly in a row, right? So you're driving from here to there, and uh, with a bit of luck, you can repair three of them in a day. And if you then want to pay that person a decent salary, say 30,000 pounds a year, is that a decent salary? I don't think it is. Um, then you can sort of imagine just how expensive that energy becomes, right? It simply won't work. The Green New Deal simply won't work. Not in the way Ursula von Leyen thinks about it, not the way uh, 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 Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez thinks about it. Um, uh, some of you who know me may have, think, uh, may have thought that Maike has uh, planted, that I planted a question with Maike, right? Uh, <laughs> because this is what uh, I've been going on uh, for years. Um, it is true that the poorest are most vulnerable to basically anything, uh, including climate change. And that is, of course, the main reason uh, to be concerned about climate change. And that may be constructed as a main reason to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but you should, of course, listen to what we just said. If people are vulnerable to climate change because they are poor, and you worry about the impact on those people, and there's two solutions there, potentially. You can cut your greenhouse gas emissions and reduce climate change, or you can stimulate economic growth and make them less vulnerable. And you should really wonder which of the two is the better and more effective strategy, which is the quicker way of uh, resolving or avoiding human misery. Uh, and there's been a lot of research on this, for some issues, it suggests that really economic growth is a faster way of reducing vulnerability to climate change and greenhouse gas emission reduction. And then we can think of such things as <coughs> coastal zones, right? We don't worry about the impacts of sea level rise of a country like the Netherlands, but we do worry about the impacts of sea level rise on a country like Bangladesh. What's the difference between the two? not the geophysical situation, not the morphology of the coast, not the technologies that are available to them, it's the economic resources that are available and the structure of the government uh, that is standing in the way in Bangladesh. Uh, so if the Bangladesh government and the Bangladeshi economy would be more like the Dutch one, we would not worry about sea level rise in Bangladesh. Um, and the same is true for malaria, but for other issues, really the only way to avoid them, particularly impacts of climate change on nature, the only way to really avoid them is greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Okay, so it's one minute to 7.30. If you have like five minutes more, I can ask if there's any more questions. If you don't, that seems like a no. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid we, we have to, you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, well, you can email both the speakers or uh, follow them on the way back home or whatever. <laughs> or maybe you can't email them. So. <laughs> it was probably yeah, judgmental. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I would like just to say a big thank you to the speakers and to this very active audience. <laughs> for trying to
disentangle a question which was not imposed but was uh, willingly uh, shallow just to unpick um, all the things that could rise from it. So that was a really nice conversation. And thanks everyone. Uh, and yes, I'll see you to, next, to the next event with the Police Economics. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to leave your email or name, uh, there's a small piece of paper that you can see has not been planned before. Yeah, yeah,